Welcome to this episode of the Be Ready Utah PrepCast. I'm Wade Matthews, the Be Ready Utah Manager here at the Utah Division of Emergency Management. And again with me are Catherine McMullen and Brian Stinson, also with the Division of Emergency Management. And this again is part two of our fun discussion on hygiene and sanitation. Make sure you check out part one on uh, our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, where we talked about the, the uh, hygiene part of it. And now we're going to jump into that topic that we all love to talk about, toilets. <laughs> toilets, 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 toilets. All right. That's so. You know, we make jokes and we laugh about it all the time, but man, this is what's really going to impact your family and your recovery and your survival of a major event. So I'm excited that we can talk about it today. And, and so beginning with, uh, you, you used to work in a, a re preparedness retail store, and most people's plans is to use a tree. Well, yeah, that's, there's so many people are dismissive of emergency sanitation because they think, well, when I go camping, I, I just go behind a tree. So, you know, there's there a lot of times that we get a couple that came in, in the store when I, when I used to work in retail. And uh, the wife would, would point at one of the sanitation kits and she goes, I want one of those for our emergency supplies. And the husband would be like, nah, we'll just go behind the tree. That's what I do when I go hunting. That's all we need to do. Right. And it, it's just so dismissive and it doesn't work doesn't work the reason you know they're right that it works when it camps and when we hunt right but the reason that it works in that situation is because there's six or seven of us um, we're gone for six or seven days on that mountain there's we're on 50,000 acres 100,000 acres um, we can dig that hole and kick some dirt on it like people will tell us to do and then we don't see what happens when we leave the animals that come and dig it up and it's no big deal it's on the mountain it's alone it doesn't translate to an environment where you have a disaster situation and a suburban environment or a high density environment environment where people suddenly need to have this solution and they're trying to recover and stay in their homes they cannot dig a hole and kick some dirt on it and fill that with putrefied human waste putrefied is when urine is mixed with solid waste it is the most toxic uh, substance on earth. We do not have the ability to deal with it. It can contaminate our groundwater. It brings in vermin, it brings in insects, and therefore brings in illness. And so we can't just dig a hole in our backyard and be filling, creating sinkholes and say, that's our plan, that's our solution. You'll find your family getting very, very sick. Now, typically what I find is that people have four different plans when they're talking about waste. Um, uh, the first is that we call the pit latrine or the dig a hole. So we just discussed why that really doesn't work in, in this environment, in our suburban environment. Um, the other one is that they're gonna bag their waste, um, which if that's your plan, it's not a horrible plan. But the question is, first of all, how many bags do you have? If you go to a store to get one of your potties, your camp potties and the bags that they need, you can get four to six bags in that box and it will cost you 12 to $14. So that's not very sustainable if they're saying that we're going to be out of water for weeks to months if there's a large scale earthquake or something, if it's a long term situation. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Um, once you do, well, let's say you have lots of bags and you had lots of budget for it and you plan for it and you have a lot. Uh, if your trash is not picking up, what are you going to do with the bag? And we run into another problem of are they piling the bags of waste at their fence and their shed and their backyard? Are they trying to bury it? And it can actually cause the same exact problems as those bags break down. It's not good for the environment. It can contaminate groundwater still. It's, it's a really messy, horrible problem. So we have an Vermin issue with that. Vermin well. are attracted. Mm -hmm. They'll dig in your yards to get to it too. And it's a, it's a big problem too. So those two of the four, so you said bury or bag, what are the other two? So the other one that sometimes people will say, well, I have a spare potty if I have a camper or trailer and RV. I have, a, I have a backup potty, we'll use that. Well, that's true as long as the disaster lasts a couple days, right, just a little bit. And then what they have to do is they have to find a dump station. So if let's talk if it is that large scale earthquake or disaster, how much fuel did you store that you can regularly drag that trailer somewhere to go to a dump station? Are the roads down? Are there issues with liquefaction or bridges that you can get to a dump station? And two, if the sewer facilities, or three, the sewer facilities are no longer functioning, they actually will lock those dump stations down. They can't mm. pump it out. It could be compromised and leaking into the ground, so they won't let you continue to fill it. Even if you did find one that wasn't full, guess what? There was a line of a thousand people and it's mm. disgusting and full now. So that's a problem and what does happen, it is not a theory, it happens in events all over the nation um, where RV or campers will just leave their neighborhood and go to the next neighborhood and dump those tanks in low-lying places and parks and along the curb and gutter and creates a big mess. 
So that's your third issue. The other solution I've, I've heard quite often is that we're going to take a cup of water and flush it down the toilet. If I put water in the bowl, it, my toilet works. It doesn't need electricity. Um, and so I can, I can use water to flush waste away from my home. There's a couple of fallacies with that. One problem is um, it doesn't take a cup of water. It takes more like a gallon or two of water. And th if they just told us that we're going to be weeks to months without water and you're literally flushing it down the toilet, that's a concern. How much water do you have stored? I don't have enough for drinking. That. We're talking right. about especially our clean water. Right. So I don't want to dispose of mine in that way. The other problem is if the ground has moved and those systems are busted up, you could be creating a sinkhole under your very own home. You could be contaminating groundwater along the way. You can be flooding your basement, the basement of your neighbor that's a little bit lower than you without realizing if those systems aren't pressurized or have breaks in them, you are creating a much larger problem by adding water to that system. So uh, all of those solutions have some big problems. Um, and could cause a worse health crisis or secondary disaster like you were saying in the first one. All of those solutions you're calling, solutions. all those plans. What so so that? what is the solution then? What is the best solution then besides the four plans that, that have all these problems? Well, I like that you said best solutions. I think that depending on where you are in the nation, what your soil type is like, what your geography is like, what the disaster is like has to be customized. So again, always listen to your local emergency management, your Department of Health. What are they telling you to do and, and are they giving advice? Um, but as a best practice in most disasters and around the globe, uh, separation is really really the number one. Separate the solid waste from the urine, and that's much safer. Urine's not really even dangerous unless you have a kidney infection. Um, it's much easier to dispose of. You can dispose of urine in a gravelly area, a shrubbery area. I wouldn't recommend putting it on a garden, although some people will say, well, you can fertilize the urine. Those are very professional gardeners that know what they're doing, and they're actually diluting it and being very careful. So don't start doing that in your disaster. You'll kill your garden, but you can dispose of urine in places where it will go down into the soil, gravity areas, shrubble, shrubbery areas. Do You don't want to create a cesspool, not on pavement, not on asphalt, nothing like that where it can pool. Even mm -hmm. if you're dumping it somewhere and you notice that it's not absorbing into the soil, don't do that. Um, but that's much easier to dispose of. And then solid waste, you can bury solid waste if you're doing it properly. You have to take a few steps to make sure that you're doing it properly and it has to be completely dried out solid waste. Um, and there's, a, there's some different best practices on how to bury. Did you want to comment on that, Brian? I know you have some yeah, experience yeah. with that. We have a, we have a graphic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. do have a graphic. To, uh, if you want to go to our website, bereadyutah.gov, uh, uh, we have this, this brochure that you can download, Hygiene and Sanitation. It has all sorts of information on what we've talked about in these two episodes. But it talks about uh, what you can do for, for that solid waste is the two-bucket system. You have one bucket for the liquid and mm -hmm. another one for the solid, but you put uh, kitty litter. Yeah. Meow, meow. You know, mm -hmm. right? You put that right, right in the bucket. Made. And what that does is, like you were talking about, is it dries out the waste. Mm -hmm. it's, it makes it, once, once it's, it's dried out, then it's inert and it's, it's safe to bury. And kitty litter is great for your soil. So it's a good product, too. Yeah, great product for your preparedness supply. So first of all, jumping back a little bit, creating our own little porta potties is still a great idea for disaster. Right. A bucket with the lid that you can go down to any hardware store, basically, or any preparedness, order these online, wherever sure, you get them, yep. fits on a five gallon bucket mm -hmm. and having a bunch of boxes of the garbage can liners that will fit that bucket Make sure size. you have the bags that fit the right size. Right, yeah. then, then having your container some of kitty litter, uh, to toilet paper, obviously, hand sanitizer, air freshener, having your own little uh, bathroom toilet. And kit. actually, if you have this, if you have the two, if you're doing the two bucket me uh, method, the urine bucket doesn't actually have to be bagged. You don't right. have to bag that. You could just empty it, empty it as often as you wish, scrub it, keep it very clean because cleanliness was the utmost, um, of the utmost importance. Um, the solid waste is the one you want to bag. And you want to have the ability to take a scoop, maybe a little bucket with kitty litter and a scoop so your kids aren't grabbing something really heavy. And they scoop and they totally cover the solid waste. It will dry it out. It prevents odors in your home. I would not recommend setting this up outside, honestly, because I've got to keep it clean. And keeping an outside environment is very tricky. Plus, you're additionally traumatizing your family who's already been through something. Now they have to go outside. Um, you can set up a two-bucket system or a two-potty system within your home. Um, and so that kitty litter will dry it out and help with the waste and and, and the odor. And you the said. odor, yep. And then this also pr uh, addresses the privacy issue that Brian sure. you mentioned earlier. Yeah, well one one thing you want to do is w when you are using the facilities, 
in our culture, we like to be very private with those kinds of things. And if you don't have privacy, your family members might be a little, what do you call it, stage fright? Hesitant. <laughs> might have stage fright or yeah. hesitant. And they might not uh, expel the waste as often as is healthy. So we need to make sure, and, and uh, we, we can use our existing bathrooms. I mean, you could even use, instead of a bucket, uh, you could even actually use your toilet for the solid as long as you put a, a, a bag inside, empty all the water out. Right, you have to do what's called creating a dry potty. Okay. And there are readily in, in, uh, instructions on available to create a dry potty, but that means all the water's out of it, it's scrubbed clean, it's plugged, the water's turned off, nothing can come in and out of it. And then you can bag that bowl, but make sure you have enough bags. Usually the potties with all our different potties, we have to have like the black outdoor bags for them to line the rim. Um, some smaller toilets can use the white ones, but know what size bags you need and make sure you have a bunch. And then, um, yeah, so you can use that or you can use the two bucket system if you're not able to use your indoor restroom. Okay, and then uh, another thing we talk, talk about, um, burying it versus storing it. If, if we have a large enough yard, uh, we, we can, maybe, maybe if we have a yard, maybe we can bury it following what is suggested Guidelines. by the health department. Sure. Again, which is also pretty much outlined on the brochure right, here as far the as the burying steps. The trick is really to layer. You do the dried out, okay. kitty littered waste, um, and then the bag that it was in, because you can't take that to your normal trash, or you're going to have a biohazard cross-contamination problem. So you have to drop that flat down in there, and that's not ideal, but we are talking about a disaster where we're trying to prevent illness. And then you need something that would uh, be great for the soil and that will help denature the waste. And there's a couple different things. You could use more kitty litter. You could use peat moss, you can use sawdust, uh, you can use ash, right? You mm -hmm. can um, use ash if you are burning something, then you can use that ash to layer, create layers, and, and really protect that hole. You have to have something heavy and flat across it that someone can't get hurt in it or fall in it. Again, we're not creating a sinkhole. There's no moisture in there, but we are gonna layer. You're gonna have some beautiful soil when you're done, the best <laughs> soil you ever had in a future garden spot. Uh -huh. um, but the trick is to layer when you're burying uh, waste like that. And do you want to mark that area? Are we removing uh, it later? Sure, are we yeah. leaving it? What are we doing? You know, that's up to to your family, your local jurisdiction, what the disaster was. If you decide later that you want to big it, dig it up and get some of the plastic out and things, then that's an option. Um, the the plastic will, will um, decompose faster than you think. In fact, I had a gentleman tell me once that they actually use cornstarch and things to make the bags now so that they will decompose faster than you think. Um, so it will be okay and it will sterilize that bag rather than having it out on the curb where it can make people sick and bring rats and things in. So. We know we, we've talked about we want to make this easy and simple and I think the two bucket system pretty much mm -hmm. does that easy and simple. All the instructions are right here on our brochure at the BeReadyUtah.gov website. And then kind of lastly, um, babies and feminine hygiene. How do we address that in this situation? Well, first of all, feminine hygiene and diapers are great to have in your preparedness supplies because most likely the disaster you're gonna experience is something like the loss of a job, something like that. So it's wonderful to have those supplies. However, the moment that you no longer have water or wastewater running in your home and your trash man is no longer picking up, what I advise is that you switch to a non-disposable product because if you're filling, we talked about sorting trash in part one and how important that can be, but if you're filling those areas up with soiled diapers and feminine hygiene, you are creating a biohazard and it will create a really big problem for your family. So there are, um, non-disposable diapers for babies are easy to get. They're almost kind of trendy. I mean, you try it out. Cloth diapers cloth is what you're saying. Is what cloth I'm diapers is what the old, we used in the gold. old days. Right, and you can scrape the solid waste into your solid waste bucket and kitty litter it and bury it with the rest you can launder it hang it up to dry and and it won't it, you'll be no worse for the wear for feminine hygiene there are that's a really personal decision um, but there are plenty of products out there that are considered non-disposable and and reusable so I would look into that and for your family what works for your family and incorporate those into your supplies so that you can use them in the event that trash is no longer picking up you gotta you gotta think about being able to reuse something okay Great information, something that we don't want to talk about. We don't talk about on a day, on a regular basis, right. but for a disaster, we need to know. I would say one, one last thing. When we're talking about burying and layering, for those people that don't have a yard mm -hmm. and don't have the option of burying, you can use that same layering option uh, inside a large garbage can. I, I would recommend nothing bigger than like a 30-gallon garbage can, you know, maybe even smaller than that because it can get pretty heavy. 
mm. uh, if you need to get rid of it. But yeah, you can do that same kind of layering with, with the, the kitty litter, the garbage bag, the waste, and, uh, and, and the ash layer or wh wh whatever other kind of thing. You can do that inside of a garbage can as well. And if that garbage can is on wheels, you can always move that downwind. <laughs> <laughs> make, make sure you have make sure you have a tight fitting lid on top of it. Yes. Yes. Downwind. <laughs> make sure you have a tight tight fitting lid on top of it. You know, if you have to store it outside, if that's the only option, so that you don't have the the critters and the vermin getting into it, and maybe secure it to uh, a fence post or something to keep it from tipping over. And I would add to that, if you are in a community where maybe it's an apartment building or a close knit community that's close together that doesn't have. Even sometimes it would be very hard for some communities to do this by themselves. Work together as a community, come together and decide what's our best, what is emergency managing, management advising us, what's the Department of Health advising us, and how can we help each other dispose of this properly to keep uh, illness out of our communities. Wow, great discussion, good information. It's been a, a good good, t a good time today talking about this uh, stuff that we don't really like to talk about regularly. So thank you for joining us, uh, and especially thank you, Catherine and Brian, for being here and sharing your, your knowledge and expertise. Thank you for watching. Uh, again, go to our website, BeReadyUtah.gov, where you can get this brochure and many others. Uh, check out Be Ready Utah on our Facebook and Twitter accounts, YouTube channel, where you can see these episodes and, and all of the past episodes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Hey, hope you enjoyed this episode of the Be Ready Utah PrepCast. Like what you're seeing? Have a question about anything related to emergency preparedness? Or do you have a comment about something you've learned as you make a plan or get a kit? We'd love to hear from you. Comment or reply to us on Twitter or Facebook at Be Ready Utah with hashtag BRU Prepcast or in the comments on YouTube. We'll talk about it on one of the next episodes of the Be Ready Utah Prepcast. Don't forget to share these videos and your own adventures in preparedness with your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers. Because anytime is a good time to talk about emergency preparedness. See you next time.